Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. I am so happy you're going to be able to hear part two of my conversation with Sat Pavan. There was so much feedback after the first episode. I know it was a longer episode than usual. There was just so much to talk about. And uh, I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the conversation, the flow of her story. There are so many emails I received letting me know how touched they were by Sat Pavan's story, at least the part they've heard so far, and that they couldn't wait to hear the second part. And I also heard from people who knew her, who knew her when she was growing up and were so happy to hear that she was telling her story and are thinking now that either they want to tell their story or at least their own memories and their own experiences were validated. A lot of them left really wondering if it was as bad as they thought it was or if the reason they were feeling traumatized was because they just didn't handle it right or handle it well enough. And it turns out actually that a lot of people realized after hearing her story and hearing other people's stories that if you're feeling traumatized, there was probably a reason. There was probably enough that was going on that was beyond your capacity to handle it or really beyond anyone's capacity to want to have to handle it, especially at such a young age. So Satpavan was born into the 3HO community and Sikh religion. She spent her childhood moving around to various 3HO communities. At the age of eight, she was sent to India with 120 other children to go to boarding school, leaving her family back in the U.S. At 16, she would be taken out of school and join YB's personal staff. As I mentioned last time, YB, or the initials of Yogi Bhajan, the head of 3HO, a lot of people who have left the organization or felt abused in the organization have a hard time or don't even want to kind of say his name or honor his name. And so they call him YB instead of Yogi Bhajan. In the last couple of years, she has left the cult but stayed within the greater Sikh community. She is one of the many women who was abused by Yogi Bhajan. She's had to unravel her life, the good, the bad, and the horror that she experienced growing up in the 3HO community, the abuse she was subjected to, the toll it took on her and her husband, and the clear choices she made to raise her children differently from how she was raised herself. She's been teaching and performing dance for the last 30 years to people of all ages and backgrounds. She's passionate about teaching and inspiring creativity, confidence, and individuality in her students, especially the younger generation, which has been a hugely positive outlet for her. Sat Pavan is also a musician who plays kirtan and has played Sikh religious music since she was a young girl and continues to do so. Her music, along with dance, has kept her going by providing a sense of healing throughout her life. She lives with her two children and husband of 27 years, raising her family and working hard to be a good person and do good in the world around her. Sat Pavan is also featured in the Vice documentary, The Dark Empire of Yogi Bhajan. Here is part two of our conversation. I am very happy to have Sat Pavan back on. We had had a whole conversation and then afterwards, as it often happens, there was more to talk about. So it would be great then for you to expand on some of the things that we talked about, but also fill in this gap, as we were saying after, about your work life and kind of moving into uh, the business run by the group, et cetera, and just what that experience was like and how it also guided you in a certain direction, maybe away from other directions you would have taken your life in, at least at that point. So where would you like to pick up the discussion? You can jump in wherever you'd like. Okay. Well, I mean, I can explain a little bit about how the companies were run and 
how they were started. I would say that Yogi Bhajan himself didn't actually start any companies and he didn't actually, he never worked in any of the companies. He had given himself the title CMA, which was Chief Management Authority, and basically had full authority in how people were paid, where people were put in the companies. And I'm talking about people within the community, because if you were outside of the community, then you go through the regular pay or or regular structure of you know going for an interview and (laughs) being hired. But if you were part of the community, you were just placed in a place. And a lot of times it had to do with convenience. Um, We need someone here. So let's just, okay, um, this person, I saw this person the other day, you know what? you're going to come work for me. You're going to go work here. He liked to constantly talk about how it, these were his companies and stuff. But I feel like one of the things that I really wanted to bring to other people in the community as I was going through this whole process was to remind ourselves that we built these companies and we worked in these companies and made them what they were. And that he, we gave him all the glory for all the work we did. But I felt like it was important to remember that we had a right to that and we could take that back. And that tended to happen a lot with people who would realize they didn't really want to be part of what he was doing and then they would walk away and then he would be upset, you know, and then there would be some kind of trying to understand how much he could try and take the company that they were now saying, no, this is my company back. So the Yogi Tea Company is one of the big companies that's still running and growing. And that company was started by just the members of the community in the sense that Yogi Tea, the original Yogi Tea is basically just Indian tea. You know, it's Indian cha, you know, chai as Americans say. And the only thing that was different in the original Yogi Tea was that because original Indian tea would be black tea. And they, I think they made it, they took the black tea out and then they put cinnamon in it to add a more sweetener, I guess. Um, And so the original spices were all Indian spices that were in Indian tea. And they called it Yogi tea affectionately for him, you know, naming after him because he's from India. And I mean, there's not one person in the original community that didn't somehow have a connection to Yogi tea in the sense that they were making it in their homes and they were serving it to their children and everybody had a pot. I mean, you knew you were walking into a 3 H home because there was that familiar smell of Yogi tea on the stove. And then some of these The ashrams, they started the Golden Temple Bakery or Golden Temple Restaurants. And this was another thing that, again, makes it seem like it's his business. But each ashram, in order to survive, needed to have a way to make money. And they started these restaurants. And I, you know, when we lived in Boston, my mom and dad both worked at the Golden Temple Restaurant. Well, my dad ended up working at a shoe store that also (laughs) from there, but that was also connected to the to um, the community, but the Golden Temple restaurant was famous for its very healthy vegetarian food. And when my mom worked there in Boston, I mean, they had a lot of Celtics players that would come in and, you know, a lot of athletes, you know, people that were interested in healthy, good food that was not expensive. You got a big, big amount of it. I mean, my regular diet growing up was black beans and rice. Then there was one, another thing called mushroom meadow, which was basically baked potatoes with sauteed mushrooms on it. And then there was another one. We had an eggplant Parmesan. These were all different dishes that were started in the Golden Temple restaurant by just members in the community that kind of like created these recipes that were trying to use vegetarian ingredients and create something that was healthy, something that felt nutritious and good and also tasted good. So then they started serving yogi tea in the restaurants. It just, it made sense. And then every business was started so that they could maintain their Tweecho or Sikh identity, you know, their turban, their thirvana, and have some ownership so they didn't have to go and be hired somewhere else. And so one of the things that they did was they had a a brokerage business and it was originally called CBB and then it changed to SGN. And that business was basically pulling in different people within the community that had good salesmanship and they started selling different products. And at the time, Stash Tea was the tea that they sold. Um, And that was the big tea out there. 
Uh, and then um, Kettle Chips was another product that they started selling. And the uh, Kettle Chips was actually founded by people that had been originally in the community and are no longer with the community. And I'm still friends and close friends with the kids and they're very good people. And so these were all businesses, again, that were started by people in the business and the community that he would then say, these are all Sikh businesses, or these are all my businesses, or these are all 3HO businesses. So with Kettle Chips, they never gave their ownership over, which was smart. And this brokerage business did sell kettle chips. And then they started selling different things like different other companies. Like there was another company called Nonix Cookies, which was another small company that was started by a 3HO person and they started selling it. So that was the whole thing was to get these small 3HO businesses out into the regular market. Let's get, let's start a little brokerage company. And then it started growing and then people started hearing about the brokerage company and they put Garden Burger and Boca Burger and Cliff Bar and they put a lot of really incredible products on the map. Anyway, so you have all these different businesses going and then you had it, um, some people who had start, started the call security business in New Mexico. People who started that had worked in security themselves and decided to start a security business. So every single thing was then handed over to YB. Like, it's like their way of saying, like, you are my teacher. I trust you. Everything I have is yours. And they hand everything over. And then he has the run of, of it. There was some businesses that he tried really hard to get and could not get because the people that ran those business, businesses saw that he was not the best businessman and he did not make the best choices and that it could affect their life's work. And so with a lot of pressure put on them, still were able to hold on to their businesses. When they started selling stash tea and then they said, oh, you know, we should start packaging Yogi tea. And what they did was they just made loose pack tea. So it wasn't even in a tea bag yet. And then it wasn't until like the early nineties that it started forming into a tea company and that it is today. And it was started um, forming in California and then was moved to Eugene, Oregon, where it is today. Wow. Okay. So there's a lot, a lot of businesses and a lot of people involved, hundreds, maybe thousands. Oh yeah. And a lot of really good people involved, you know, really hardworking people that really wanted to do something positive. So the Yogi Tea Company, the people on the ground that are working there are hardworking, good people that want to be part of a company that sells good, healthy products. And there is that stain of YB's connection to it. And I think that they are trying to remove that stain. They've removed his picture and removing quotes of his and things and trying to just take it away. But I think that stain is still there because it's always been known as his tea company, but it never really was. That was kind of how I felt. Like, I hope it survives for the sense that I saw how it grew and I saw so many good people involved in it and still see that there's so many good people involved in it. And I would hate for that to fall apart. It's like, I look at a lot of companies that were started by different um, you know, brag aminos. And there's like, there's a lot of companies that were connected to like different cults. And then, you know, and then now you just see the product and it's as long as the product is, is good, you know, but I think that they have to, you know, in terms of how the money, I mean, once he died and once the management kind of changed in the way the company was run, I think finally they're at a place where the employees are getting paid really well. And they have really good benefits and they do a lot of outreach with communities, with local communities, with they support a school in Nepal, they support different schools in South America. So they try to do something positive with the money and the, the profit. And but again, I'm not in I don't know every little detail. And I, you know, I hope that they're doing the right things. And what I see locally, when I see just with the people that I know that are still involved, they are still they are really trying to do what is right and those main people are fully in support of the women that have come forward and fully acknowledge that these things happened not necessarily the board that's a whole nother story but the the people that are directly there do support that so Right. I mean, I think a lot of groups that are not good groups employ good people who are 
relied upon to have a very good work ethic. Sometimes they feel that they're working for the cause. Sometimes they feel that they're working for a higher power. And there are a lot of motivators, but that a lot of people are holding themselves to a particular standard. And I know people in charge of groups like these count on that. It's also true that sometimes people get used for these companies or at uh, crossroads in their lives where they could go on to school or they could be studying what they want to be studying. Instead, they're told that this is the vision that the leader has for them. This is what they're supposed to be doing. And at the end of the day, you find that, you know, your karma is sort of drawing you towards this, but it is to make more money for the organization and make more money for the leader. So I'm wondering how that played out in your life and other people you know. Well, I would say with people in my generation that worked in the businesses were those people that were told college is a waste of time, come work for the businesses, serve the community, serve this higher power, get paid absolutely nothing. Well, that's not true. We got paid, but basically nothing. Serve the mission. You know, that was constantly told to us, come serve the mission. And those that bucked the system and went to college were ridiculed or isolated from other people in the community or treated pretty badly until they had their own success. And then all all of a sudden, YB was very proud of them, you know, because that's how he was. If you managed to like not do what he said and then have success from that, then he wanted to have a connection to that success. But, you know, I was one of those people that I was the really good student that did everything that I was told to do and served in the ways that I was told. I mean, to me, I am, I am a perfect example of if people look at me and go, you didn't amount to the things you, you could have amounted to, or you've never really made it anywhere. I'm like, I am a product of this community and I was raised in this community and I did everything the community asked of me. And even coming to terms with all these things, is also part of my upbringing of learning, of reading and being told stories of people who stood up against tyranny or against oppression or against those that are are overpowering or taking advantage of others. And that's really when I decided to come forward was because I started not even recognizing my own self, just recognizing other people that were going, that were speaking out and feeling like I needed to back them. You know, that strength also came from the community that taught me these things that you stand up for those. So I do find it really kind of funny when I see people who have been not supportive at all, who basically calling the women the liars and and stand by YB through everything, still talk in these terms of like, we stand up for righteousness. And we, it's like, I just look at them and just like, no, you don't, you don't. Because when it was put right in front of you, you chose the side of one person had that much power. I don't think anyone should have that much power that that they can get away with doing what he did and still have the support that he has by people. So for those of us that did work in the businesses and didn't go to college, and it was not a big group of us, it was a small group of us because a lot of parents were just like, no, my kid's going to college. And luckily they had that. Um, I didn't really have that. I mean, my parents didn't know to put their foot down and I didn't really, and, you know, I was also very sure that I was doing the right thing. So I just, by doing what he said, which, which was not to go to college and do that. And so I've never had a job interview. I I've never had a job that I wasn't handed. I don't know that I've ever really known my own worth as far as what I should be paid or what I could offer to the world because I've been so lost in what I've been told I have to be. But I think that the way I look at things now is I see like the generation after me, they were much more full force. We're going to college and they just had a different way of doing it. And he was older and he just, he didn't push it the way he pushed it with us. And so a lot of the kids that are the generation right below me that are maybe five, eight years younger than me, they all have gone to college. They all had careers. Even those that worked in the businesses worked in the business as like a stepping stone while they were in school to have like a side job, but none of them really stayed within the businesses. And there was always this feeling like if you did what I was doing, you were doing it right. And if you did what those kids were doing, you were doing it wrong. And now I was like, no, it wasn't. They were doing it right. <laughs> you know, um, I don't really have much to show for what I did. 
by staying. You know, the and the the thing also is that WHO employees were underpaid. And so it didn't really matter how high up they went into the company. I had people that were under me in the company that I was like, a, you know, a, a manager to, and I was paid less than all of them. You know, <laughs> it was like, uh, because they could get away with that with me. They couldn't get away with that with a regular person, you know, that would know their their rights and know that they their worth. And so, yeah, they got away with a lot of those kinds of things that, you know, and I, I, I'm glad that they're running things differently now. They don't have him. He had power over every single person's salary. And if you got a raise, he would tell you you got a raise because he wanted to give you a raise. And so you felt that he was the one person that cared about you and the one person that was looking out for you. And, you know, I remember having a breakdown thinking, God, when he dies, who's going to look out for me? Because he's the only one that really cares. Hmm. Very powerful. And I think, yes, kind of holding on to that power on his part, going back to this idea of not knowing what you're worth and what your value is, that he's then the one who can decide that. Uh, he can decide, I guess, how you define how much you're worth and if you're doing a good job, et cetera. It sounds also like when someone has that power, you feel like you have to constantly be in their good grace, that it's easy then to be demoted or to have your salary probably decreased. That often sort of sets up a reward and punishment based on behavior, not having anything to do with the company. And so I'm wondering if that was part of that. Oh, yeah, he he did that. That was definitely part of it. I mean, I didn't find this out until just very recently from my father. My father was a top salesman for the company and he did really well. He would get sales manager of the year from Cliff Bar, from Gardenberger. I mean, every, he was a really good salesperson and he still is. And I didn't find out till very recently that he was giving half his salary back to YB. YB had decided that he should not be making more than $60,000 a year. Anytime he made more than that, he would say, that has to go back into the businesses, which now we kind of know that actually meant back into YB's pocket, you know, back into the businesses. But does that even make sense? I mean, he's getting paid by all these different companies selling their products, and then he has to send money back to them. So, you know, taking less than because he was serving something bigger, but in the end, it affected his financial situation. There was very few men in the businesses that were successful. Men were all a threat to him. And so, you know, because they were competition, I think the men that were in, in the businesses, there was a couple that were in high positions. The majority of the people that were in high positions were women. And out of all those women, all the women that were in high positions in the company were all sleeping with him, every single one. And this is stuff that I've found out, you know, in the last couple of years in my own investigations of this. But, you know, I saw it happening before my eyes. They were getting paid better. They were all managers. There were people in my generation that he had brought into his harem that were being able to go to college, you know, were immediately put in managerial positions, immediately given three, four times the amount of money I was being given. And then I, of course, come to find out why. And it's so if you were sleeping with him, you were taken care of. And if you were a man of, you know, some certain something that, that, you were loyal enough to him that he had some control over you, you had a chance at maybe a decent salary. But the majority of the 3HO people that worked in the businesses were just paid barely anything. And every single person was barely getting by. Every single person was trying to keep up with all the different community events that you're expected to go to. And a lot of the parents are trying to send their children to sporting school in India then also the the entire outward appearance in the community is wealth, is everybody looks wealthy. Nobody shows any sign of poverty. No one shows any sign of not having something. It's like everybody's very competitive with each other and everyone's always trying to make, you know, wear the, the designer uh, outfits, of course, all white, but wear the designer outfits and wear the designer purses and wear the fanciest jewelry. So it's, it's a very confusing thing to not have the finances to do this, but then to constantly be put yourself in debt really to kind of appear that you have it. Cause there was this thing called prosperity consciousness. And it was like, you know, if you, if you 
project prosperity, then God will bless you with prosperity. And if you project poverty, then you will never get there. So everyone wanted to project this prosperity. But in reality, everybody was at that worked in these businesses were at his will, you know, what, at what he decided they were worth. And because of that, very few people actually had the means to look the way they that everyone was trying to look and act. And so it just created, a, you know, a lot of a lot of problems. <laughs> and how many of those people even recognize that today, I wonder. Are there still a lot of people working for these companies who you feel don't recognize that? Yogi Tea has very few 3HO employees. And the couple of employees that I know that are Sikh employees are no longer really part of 3HO anymore. They don't consider themselves part of 3HO. They, they may look that way to the outside person. Oh, okay, they're a white person and they wear a turban, but they don't necessarily feel that way, that connection. They feel more connected to just being a Sikh and trying to do something. But the, there, yeah, there's not that many employees that are 3HO within Yogi Tea anymore. And within the other businesses, as far as I understand, a call is no longer. I know they're trying to start some other businesses with the boards and stuff. And I'm not really involved in a lot of that. And I don't really know, you know, what's going on there. Um, but I don't trust the people that are involved there. And I would say that a lot of the people that live in New Mexico that are still connected in that way are still loyal to him. Not everybody, but there are still people that are. Mm, very interesting. You know, I wonder also just about when people work at these companies, oftentimes people in retrospect will say, I felt like I could never take a break. I had to go when I was sick. I had to go when I was very pregnant. I had to just I had to be there in, in long hours without complaint. And sometimes the working conditions were not conducive. There's a lot of standing or whatever else and moving around. I'm wondering what it was like from what you remember. Those kinds of things are really hard because I want to be careful about telling stories that people are not comfortable, you know, sharing their stories. And I want to be respectful of that. But from my own family, I mean, there are members of my family that were living in complete poverty as far, you know, working for the businesses, not being paid barely anything and just barely surviving. And, you know, one person that I am related to, he was doing security for YB and on his off day, you know, not getting paid, um, you know, on a weekend or something and doing security for him or, or maybe he was getting paid because they, you know, it was all included. If he was working in the businesses and doing security, you're just getting paid a salary. But anyway, there was a car accident that happened that was not his fault. And he was also driving a, a call security vehicle and he needed some health coverage, some massages and some chiropractic, you know, some different things for his injuries. And YB was screaming that you're stealing from me. You're stealing from me because he asked for how these things were going to be able to be covered because he didn't have the means to do it. And it turned out another person in the community who worked as a chiropractor said, I'm just going to take care of you for free of charge. And, you know, this is between you and me. And, but that, that kind of stuff happened all the time where if you needed something from him and he was not wanting to give it to you, then he would make you feel like crap for, for even suggesting anything. He would do funny things where he would take somebody and say, you're going to come work for me. And I'm going to give you, because of all the karma that you've had in your last lifetime, you're going to be so lucky. I'm going to save you from the karma now, but I'm going to give you a thousand dollars a month and you're going to work, you're going to do whatever I ask. And I know like one person who was one of my dad's best friends, that kind of broke the spell for him. That's when he left because he had two children. He was a grown man. He had worked forever for YB. And then YB decides to cut his salary to $1,000 a month and saying that he's burning his karma. And I think that just broke the spell for him. It was like, wait, I can't, I, I can't support my family on this. I'm, you're telling me to to go backwards instead of forwards. I can't do that. And I think that he just very, very quietly left. And when my dad ran into him, he told him, you know, he's like, I, I didn't want to 
say anything against the community. I didn't want to say anything against YB. I just felt like it was my own thing, but I needed to do what was right for me and my family. And, you know, it broke my dad's heart that he felt like he didn't even want to share that stuff because he didn't want to, again, go against YB, even though it was YB that was kind of broke. It, it's him saying that, that broke the spell and realized like, I can't be part of this community if they're not even caring about how I'm being treated. So he did that kind of stuff all the time. He he made you feel so bad if you wanted just a little bit more. He hated spending money. If you were independently wealthy, you were in his inner circle. He would find a way. And then you would be buying all the lunches and you would be taking him to the jewelry stores and you would be paying for everything. And I know I have very close family friends in Florida who hosted him every year and would spend thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on a week at uh, like a, a five day visit because they would be he would go on these huge shopping sprees, you know, where he we'd go to Epcot and he'd pay he'd have to pay for everybody to go to Epcot Center, every single person's ticket. And then all he would do was go to the Japanese pavilion, buy a bunch of things, buy every have not him buy, but you know, get a bunch of things and then tell everyone on the staff, all the ladies, all his harem, get whatever you want. And then they'd leave. They wouldn't even go on any rides. They wouldn't do anything. They literally went to Epcot, buy a ticket just so they could shop at the Japanese pavilion and then leave. But my family friends, they were wealthy. They had a successful business and they did that for a long time. So that's when he liked you is when you were independently wealthy. Then it was like, okay, now I need to keep this person happy. And now I need to pump this person up a little bit because I want them to spend their money on me. And they did. Wow, they did. I mean, when you talk about going on shopping sprees and having people get whatever they want on someone else's dime, that doesn't sound very spiritual. So there's so much about this that doesn't sound very spiritual. And going back to what you were saying about finding out that the people who were treated a certain way were treated like the, the men were a threat to him. So they were demoted or being given a hard time. And, and that guy too has this accident while he's working on his day off and he has, there's no compassion towards him and no, really no protection. And luckily someone came forward to help him out, but it shouldn't have to be that it's just luck. Uh, he should feel taken care of, especially after devoting himself in this way to YB and the organization. When people start hearing stories like you doing your research, which means other people could do it too and find out that the women who were given raises or moved higher up on the food chain we're sleeping with him. And then you were saying a little while back that no matter how much evidence there is like that, there's some people who just don't want to see it. They just don't want to believe it. They won't hear it. They won't talk to you. The thing that frustrates me the most out of all of it is when I hear someone say to me, well, this person's not saying that. And I'm going, well, I know all the sexual things he that person did with him. And so they're acting like they didn't do that. But then it's like, okay, it's not my battle. Like I can't, I feel frustrated that people are still trying to, I, you know, I th sometimes just being silent makes people decide whether they're supporting it or not supporting it. And so those people go, oh, well, this person's not saying anything. That means that they're not okay with these allegations or this person's not saying anything, that means that maybe they have something that they're not sharing yet. You know, so, I mean, the amount of information that I was able to get was also because I had been on staff. And I think there are members of staff that felt a sense of responsibility knowing that I was so closely in the lion's den and not really aware of what was going on. And then also having my own experiences and realizing, you know, I've had apologies from a lot of those people. And I think because of that, they've been pretty honest with me about, okay, well, now let's just tell you what's been going on. And it was mind blowing. And now I'm kind of just like, I want people to know because I want them to be woken up. But I've gotten to the point where I realize I have to do what's what makes sense. And if someone asks me information, I will tell them. But I can't force information on someone that doesn't want to hear it because then I'm just kind of coming across as petty and, and angry or whatever else. And nobody's going to hear you if they're not asking you to tell them. They're just, they don't want to hear it. Well said. Well said. That is very true. 
Yeah, people, uh, when they're not ready or they just don't want it to be true. So many people in groups too are told to question the source of the information rather than taking in the information. So then it seems to kind of boomerang back on you and before it goes back to them where, you know, people wonder what you're up to and why you're doing this or why you're, you know, making something up uh, to make YB look bad. I think that is such a defense and people are really, by saying that people are saying, I'm either not ready to see the truth or I feel like it will just be so hard to look at my whole life having been devoted to this person and raising kids. And I understand that. I have a lot of compassion for people that haven't, that haven't come to terms with it for those reasons. I get that. I get how hard it is to face it. And honestly, it still blows my mind that things that happened to me happened to other people. I mean, I really thought my whole life, these were secrets that happened to me and they weren't, and they weren't worthy of, of speaking about to destroy him or a a whole community. And so I completely understand that. But I also, with so many people that have been hurt and so many things that have happened, I feel like there has to be a time where you face it. And, um, and the truth is, is he hurt the people that are protecting him, but they don't want to see it yet. You know, he took advantage of everyone. There was no one that I know people to this day that protect him. And I heard him say to my face, this person's completely insane. This person's a wacky lady. This person, I've heard him, I've heard him insult everybody. I, I've seen pictures. People will say, oh, here's YB with the Dalai Lama. See two holy men. I was like, oh, you, he's, he, he talks so badly about the Dalai Lama when it was just, when he went, you know, he called him the most boring man he ever, he ever heard. All he does is say the same thing over and over again. No chicken safe with the Dalai Lama. I don't think there's anyone that he didn't insult or didn't see as com- competition or didn't feel in some way that he needed to better. That's just how he was, he, you know, and I could say that those same people that are protecting him might say, oh, I remember when he called Seth Hubbin stupid and crazy. That wouldn't surprise me at all because he did it as soon as you were in the room. He talked about you and mocked and and said things about you. And he said that, you know, he did it to everyone. So the people who are still protecting him, I think they're protecting themselves and protecting their life that they have lived. And how do you come to terms with? recognizing that it wasn't all that you thought it was. And that is very painful. And it's very painful to come to terms with he wasn't all that we thought he was. That's very hard. You know, I wish he had been. I really do. I wish he had been this incredible human being on earth, but he wasn't. He was, now that I know, understand it, you know, he was a insecure, narcissistic, (laughs) not capable of love, really. I don't think he was capable of love, but he used that term very loosely. He told people, I love you. And you felt so special when he said it, but he, you know, it wasn't a hard thing for him to tell people, but I don't think he truly knew how to do it, to actually love even himself. You know, I just don't think so. And um, yeah, I mean, his family protects him, his family, his sons, they never they never earned any of the the money that they have. They never earned their positions in the businesses. You know, his wife did, as far as I understand, did have a degree in psychology. I don't really know that she served much in that position, but they were given status because of their connection to him. And I mean, I was actually in the room with just the family one time when I was there in the evening on evening duty, and they were yelling and saying that they wanted him to leave the entire Sikh Dharma, which is what the 3HO community was called, to them. And they wanted to be the ones that owned it all. And he said he couldn't do that. And he ended up leaving it to four women that he was sleeping with who, um, I don't know. Um, But anyway, uh, the the relationship between the son, the family, um, not so much the daughter, but the two sons and the wife, It's like you could watch this show like Succession or you could see Donald Trump and his sons or you could a lot of these kinds of families. It's the same. You know, there's they all kind of protect each other, but they all don't really like 
each other <laughs> or are in positions that they are, haven't really earned or deserve or given respect that they haven't earned or deserve. Mm -hmm. And that is actually a very common thing. You have it with uh, Reverend Moon's family, Unification Church, L. Ron Hubbard's family, a lot of people where they are treated a different way. They're under a microscope. They are kind of deified at the same time, sometimes crucified. And they fight because there is this competition for being liked. Some also want nothing to do with any of it. And so then they're kind of kept out of the will or seen as a traitor to everybody. And so there's usually a lot of something, a lot of drama that comes with this kind of intensity. And it's very uncomfortable. It's very interesting that they had these conversations in front of you. So it sounds like you were privy to hearing a lot of things. Oh, yeah. I, I actually remember I was pretty uncomfortable because they were all yelling at each other. And the older son looked and said, you know, Puppet, should you be here? And and uh, and then he said, "Oh, she can stay." And then his wife's like, "Yes, she's family." So I was like, "Okay, I guess I'm staying." I was kind of not really wanting to be there, but I was there. And she went to a friend of mine who, at the time, read people's palms, which you know, YB was very much into astrology and palm reading and all that kind of mysticism. And she said, "Is he going to give me Sikh Dharma?" And my friend at the time was like, "No, he's not." And she just said, you know, I earned it. Me and my, my kids have made so many sacrifices. And I can kind of understand that way of thinking in the sense of like, yes, they did make sacrifices because they were a family unit. And then all of a sudden it was broken up. But at the same time, he broke them up. He was, that was their family. And, you know, if they had been paid for by the businesses or by the community to go to college and make their own life in their own way and be their own successful person, that would have been more to me acceptable than just living off of the community and living and, you know, and getting paid. They get paid millions of dollars every year just to be. And for, for what, you know, what have they done to earn that? Then the other side is all the people who work 16, 20 hours and are, not even able to get by and have to seem okay, have to seem prosperous, like you're saying, to be able to prove something, I suppose, or get what they think that they're going to be getting if they look that way. But they're from behind the scenes, probably really struggling and they might be hungry and might be ill and might have been sleeping on couches. And it's important that we're talking about this because it happens in so many groups just like this. Uh, especially the larger groups that have businesses that millions and millions of dollars are coming in and people are not able to get their car started because it's so old and, you know, the battery has died so many times and they're made to feel guilty for wanting more and having even a fair wage, a living wage. And the disparity is so great, but there are also all these justifications for it. And so when you were not given enough to live on, you didn't have a frame of reference to know that it was too little because how would you have known you weren't out in the world? But when you did start to notice it, again, what were you told about why you were supposed to be fine with the little that you were receiving? We were just told that we were serving a mission and that in the end, we would be rewarded. Each one of us were told at some point, this is all yours you will have all of this. You're going to be more wealthy than you can ever imagine. So there was always this kind of promise of that. But there's also this strange thing that goes, that we're being trained to even think to ask for those promises to be fulfilled is greedy, is wrong, is bad. So you're promised with these empty promises of some kind of financial reward or whatever, but don't say it out loud because then you're greedy, you know, then you're bad for doing that. So you have to just trust that it's going to come. And I think for myself, <laughs> there's a amount of patience that, I mean, I, I, that, that's one thing that I've actually sometimes shock myself with how patient I have been able to be within this community. And there was just years and years and years that I just kept thinking, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it was like realizing it's just not, you know, I, I had to finally come to terms with that. And even when I did come to those 
understand when I figured that out at some point, um, and and this isn't even that long ago, I didn't blame him. I blamed the community. I thought you guys, oh yeah, I blamed them. I thought you guys didn't live up to his promises. You guys didn't take care of us the way that we were promised we would be taken care of. Why didn't you do that? And I, you know, felt hurt and upset at people within the community that I felt had or that they could make those things happen. And I didn't blame him. Wow. You, in your own mind, couldn't even consider having it be where he would be blamed. So what do you think was in your training that had you just immediately point the finger elsewhere? Well, because he would do things where he would say, I've set it up that this person is going to help you with this or that. He often would direct somebody, look after this person or do this for this person or take this person out on a shopping spree, whatever it was, he was always kind of handing you off to someone else. And so when he would say, all these things are going to happen, I mean, there was two times where I had to sign documents saying that I was in his will and saying that I was going to be actually paid money from his will. I mean, two times. And I remember when he died, there were people around me and some of these people are still very much with him were, that were like, there are people in, in the, on staff that must have not fulfilled the will because you, why weren't you taken care of? You know, he always said you were going to, you know, there were people that were like, I always assumed you were going to be handled, handed something. And when I got handed nothing, there were, there was confusion from a lot of people and myself included. And I didn't understand. I was like, what did I sign? What was that all about? Um, and so I didn't blame him because I thought he constantly made it seem like he was the one taking care of me. He was the only one that cared. It's like when I had been working in the businesses for about six or seven years and I was making $1,200 a month and they decided to do an annual check of everyone's salaries and see you know, if we were gonna add any raises. And next to my name, they wrote $50. The managers of the company, the CEO, $50. So they were going to give me an extra $50 a month. So it's going to be $1,250. And he crossed out $50 and wrote $300. So it went from $1,200 to $1,500 a month. And I saw him do that. And it made me think he's the only one that cares. They're, they think I'm only worth $50 more a month. And he's saying, no, she's worth $300 more a month. Again, I had no concept of $1,500 at six years in a, in a business where I'm working six, seven days a week, early in the morning, late in the evening was still very underpaid. <laughs> to me, it was like, he actually cares to give me more money than they think I'm worth. So that was, that was happened a lot where he would say stuff like, you know, this person, this person, this person, they don't like you but I'm, I'm making sure you're okay, or I'm going to let them know who you are. or I'm going to let them know how special you are to me. So he did that with me and I, things he did with me. It was pretty uh, common that he did with a lot of people. So it's not like it was unusual. And that definitely sets the tone for he cares. He's going to make sure that all these promises are kept. And if they're not kept, it's because somebody dropped the ball and it wasn't him. And so don't blame him, blame everybody else. Wow. If someone really cares about you, they will just, first of all, pay you the minimum at very least, right? That is dictated by law and make sure that you have insurance and make sure that, you know, you don't, your days aren't too long and that you have a weekend, et cetera. But also, I think the more important part is how often I hear from you, from others who were in his group, how often he was working an angle. So people who really care about you would just add to your salary, but wouldn't say, all these other people don't care about you, but I do. I mean, that is so manipulative. And it does make you feel like he's it. And that without him, you would be at the mercy of all these other people who don't like you. I wonder in retrospect, the people he said didn't like you, did they not like you? Or was he making up stories to make himself seem like your protector and kind of your knight in shining armor? 
I think it's a, a bit of both, but some of that's also manipulated by him. He was very good at, you know, speaking about someone to others. I, it's like if he if he gave you a positive positive attention publicly, then you were immediately seen as someone that should be given positive attention. And if he gave you negative attention publicly, then the same was true. And so, you know, he would do stuff where he would speak about someone to others. And then everyone would think badly of that person. And then he would tell that person, none of these people like you, but I like you. So that's setting it all up. I do think there's a lot of people within the community that don't really like each other. And I think it's just personalities. And I think it's being pitted against each other in different at different times by him or by others. I do think right now, the people that are still within the community that are still supporters of his, I kind of laugh a little bit at the strange bedfellows that they, because I know a lot of these people, I mean, I know most of them, majority of them, and they don't each like each other, but now they're all in the small group of people that is still his group. So I think that's kind of funny. And I'm sure that you know, if they heard me say that, they'd be like, that's not true. We we always didn't like you, which I, yeah, I don't really care. But I do know like the different personalities that are there. And I think that is kind of funny, but what are you going to do? You know? Right. You know, it, it is fascinating to be able to pull back the curtain and see how things are being run. And you're right, crafting a whole scenario to have it play out so that he seems like you're Victor, and without him, you would have no one. I mean, he seems to have found a way to give you that message, which means he probably gave a lot of people that message. Oh, he! If you were a male, you were going to be a drug addict living in the gutter if you didn't do what he told you to do. And if you were a female, you were going to be a prostitute in the streets living in the gutter if you didn't do what he asked you to do. So, they were pretty common things he said to people. And um, wow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I think I, I also think about, you know, the appearance in a sort of all white, very serene. And I'm thinking about the words that he used, the things that he would say, so dramatic and damning. And I'm sure that was also kind of a weird juxtaposition for you that here, is that spiritual that somebody talks like this, well, you know? Well, you become numb to, I mean, if this is what you've heard your whole life, you think this is what it is. And I mean, even my husband one time said he met someone who is very respected in the greater Sikh community. And when my husband met him, he was very kind and, and humble and sweet to him. And my husband immediately felt the sense of maybe distrust. Maybe that's too harsh of a word or, or just skeptical um, because he was like, He's not screaming at me and telling me I'm full of shit. I mean, that's what spiritual teachers do. That's what that's what religious godly men do. They they call you out on stuff and they they tell you stuff you didn't realize how bad you were and they're going to fix you and that's what we were raised with. And so how do you <laughs> that's how you understand it is supposed to be. And we were constantly told how lucky we were and how sad for the people that had people in their lives that were just boring, like the Dalai Lama and just saying, be love, you know, loving, be, love is good, you know, just being sweet and soft spoken. Oh, that's, that's not someone you can trust. You need to find the person that's going to scream at you and tell you you're full of shit. That's the person that truly loves you. And that's what we were told. And even saying that out loud, I'm going, yeah, but that's, that's what I know that like, it, I'm even realizing it right now, how that made perfect sense. Is that abusive? Maybe it's, maybe I, you know, I'm God, <laughs> it's abusive. It is abusive. Right. And it's like someone hitting you and saying, I'm doing this for you or because I love you. Oh yeah. I mean, he was, he could be violent. He, he hit people. He punched guys in the face. He, he could be very violent. And, but that was, that was a blessing. They would walk away and feel like he just smacked me in the face. He just pushed me down. And that's a good thing because he loves me and he wouldn't do that to people he didn't truly love. Everyone was very abusive within the, on the staff, the way that everyone talked to each other. Everyone was 
you know, it, 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 was, it was constantly an abusive environment that you don't realize until you remove yourself from it and then go, oh my God, I can breathe. I don't have some, someone screaming at me all the time. You know, it's like my, my sister, like myself, made his breakfast when she was in a different state and I was in California. I made his breakfast and she one time didn't cut the onions properly. And the woman who was still, a, you know, this woman is like trying to make sure everybody stays loyal to YB. She said to my sister, who was 18 at the time, 17 at the time, you must be the, you must be, be the biggest fucking idiot that ever walked the fucking earth if you don't fucking know how fucking stupid you are. Because she cut the onions in a different direction. And that was just fine. That was acceptable. And, you know, it made my sister cry and it's not acceptable to my sister and it's not acceptable to me, but that was acceptable in the way that was the, the culture that was, that he created. And that was acceptable in that culture. And we, and so I guess in the, when I say acceptable was meaning there wasn't anyone you could turn to, to do anything about it. You know, you couldn't complain to anyone. You couldn't have that person talk to. You couldn't have that apology happen unless they somehow deep down realized they had done something that they deserved an apology. But that was just the way that people acted and talked to each other. And you just had to do it. And if you showed any sign of, I'm not sure if I want to do something I'm being asked to do, then it was like, you do this or oh, come on, Sapavin, don't you know everything he did for you? This is what you're being asked to do for the community. You need to do this. And I mean, that was my whole life was constantly being told all the things I had to do for free. And I could not say anything against doing. I had to do it. And I was serving and serving something greater. And that's my big question today is, what was this mission I was serving? What is this mission and what are the people that are holding on to all of this? What are they still thinking they're serving? What was it all about? Yeah, no, I I know of people who are still who are still on the ranch waiting either for him to be reincarnated or that they do believe that he's still watching what they're doing. Oh, yeah, well, because he said, you know, when I die, I'm going to be more powerful than I am while I'm alive. He said, when I die. Those of you who have wronged me, I'm going to haunt you and you are going to feel my wrath like you never felt when I was alive. And those of you who love me and those of you who served me correctly, you will feel my presence with you and everything good that happens in your life. Just know I have a hand in it and that I'm making sure it happened. And people do that. They go, thank you, City Singh Saab. Thank you, Yogi Bhajan, if something positive happens in their life. To this day, they still feel. When I told my godmother, uh, you know, who was a big deal in my life, she was very important in my life. And when I told her before I publicly told other people what is going on, the last thing she said to me was, I'm going to go meditate on him. And if this all happened, he's going to let me know. And I just thought there's no chance of reaching her if that's how she's going to deal with it, because, you know, she's going to meditate on on this, you know, figment of her imagination. <laughs> right. And go to him in her mind to question whether or not he ab <laughs> abused his power uh, in, and did these things. Right. Exactly. Which is something he would never have admitted to. No. When alive, never. That's an amazing thing. Also, going back to the cutting the onions wrong, because there isn't a wrong way to cut an onion. <laughs> First of all, let's do that. But it just gives you a, a little taste of what kind of crap you want to go through. I mean, there was a select group of these young teenage girls that were picked to do as breakfasts and things like that, and then we were all like treated like crap by everybody else if we did anything slightly different. And yeah, it's just the way that it was. A lot of people wonder why after they leave organizations like this, they have a very hard time kind of settling their system and relaxing. And oftentimes it's because of things like this, because everything mattered to that degree and you were being watched and you were going to get punished uh, or publicly shamed. And so having this watchful eye and a punitive one all the time can make you never be able to fully relax. 
So a lot of people I, I find have trouble with sleeping and have trouble just quieting their body and their mind. Well, his voice came to me for so long and not in an abusive way, in a loving way, which really pissed me off because it was like, mess. it's like messing with your head. And it's, and again, if anyone listened to this and our believers would be like, see, he was right. He's coming to you in your dreams. It was just these memories of these weird little faces he would make at me or little kissing motions he'd make at me or little like whispering I love you's and stuff like that. And I realized that it was just kind of a way of me not of like almost trying to like block out the things that I was trying to face in, you know, now. And so I just started saying, fuck you. Every time that happened, it was just like, that just became my mantra. Like, fuck you, get out of my head. And now it's like, it's like, I don't need that because yeah, it was trained for so long. It's very hard to, to understand. And I, and I, it's, yeah, it's just, uh, it's like, even, even talking about it, there's this little part of you going, I never thought I would be here. I never thought I would be on the end of like exposing anything. Cause I never thought there was anything that I had that would, should be exposed. And I never, you know, I always felt very protective of, of everything of the community and of him, especially, but now I'm like, okay, I have to face these things because they're not okay. They're not good for anybody in any situation, in any community that is going through that someone has, that one person has so much power that you have no sense of yourself anymore, that, that they have that much power. I don't think anyone in life should have that much power ever on it over others, ever. No, there is a quote about that it was that the only power you should aspire to have is the power you have over yourself when someone is given that much power where they can get away with anything it is very frightening and it all depends upon their conscience if they have one if like you're saying they they have the capability of being loving or if they don't and if they don't then all bets are off they can do whatever they want and feel okay about it so when you're saying also that, you know, it's hard for you to face what he did. And so he was in your head, but with the positives and also with some of the creepy positives, right? Oh yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I, I recognize that too. That's a weird flirtatious thing he used to do. Yeah. Right. And I think that a lot of leaders who want to be seen as being omniscient and omnipotent will say, I can read your thoughts. I know everything that you're thinking that you're going to be doing. And also after I die, I am going to come to you in your dreams and I'm still going to be tangled up in your head. And it happens all the time from what I've seen that when people have been in these kinds of situations, they do have nightmares. They also do have kind of recurring thoughts of this person being in their head because that person was in their head for so long that it's not that they are still controlling them, but this is the way your brain processes what you've been through. And it would be hard for you to face what happened, but it's really good that you are facing it. And I think by coming forward, you are having him face it too. Now, whether or not he's around and, and can face it, but really kind of you're saying, you know what, I, I need to face this, but you do also. And I, I think that that is something that you deserve. Yeah. That's another funny thing with the community that still supports is just how quick you can be dismissed if you have, if you come to any kind of realization that goes against him and this perfect light and how quick everything you've done, all the service you've given, all the, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of your time and energy and everything is just completely just dismissed. And then it's just like, oh, she's crazy. <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what happens. And, and, and then it's like, wow, how you can do that so quickly to someone who affected you in a positive way, who served you in some way. I can never be like that. I mean, if I have in people who left before me, I apologize because that's where my compassion really comes from is knowing I've been there and knowing how hard it is 
to face. Thank you so much for offering more of your memories and your thoughts and your insights. It's really valuable. It's very powerful. And I know that it, it can take a lot out of people to, to tell these stories. So I really, I appreciate you doing this. I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. One more thing before you go. I am so grateful to Sat Pavan for continuing the conversation with me today. As it always happens, there are stories that are harder to share than others. And there are stories that you leave out, sometimes on purpose, and sometimes you'll get to later. But there is definitely an openness, a willingness that Sat Pavan has to share what is important for her to share, not only for herself, for her healing, for her empowerment, but to be able also to say, without saying it, I'm not afraid of you, YB, anymore to the point where I'm going to keep your secrets and I'm going to let you in some way, even though you've passed away, get away with it. And I give her a lot of credit. I think what's also true is when she was talking about YB, Yogi Bhajan, she was talking about coming to terms with recognizing who he really was. Now, when you're in a system, when you're in a relationship, when you're in a cultic group, when you're with someone who is pretending to be something that they're not to the outside world, to the general public, you can start to think that your vision of this person is supposed to match other people's. You're supposed to be enamored with them. You're supposed to be trusting. You're supposed to look up to them. You are supposed to feel safe in their company. But suddenly, if something happens and all of that dissipates, you can start to wonder if it's just you. And maybe this was something that was paying penance in some way. You deserved it in some way. Or maybe you were misinterpreting it. So much of the stories that I hear, but especially with Sat Pavans, is this very confusing, contradictory piece. These cult leaders or these controlling partners will say something and do something completely different to talk about how there was this need for modesty. And at the same time, he's having her watch shows with people having sex and then making fun of her while she's blushing. None of it makes sense. None of it comes together logically. It all feels like one mind game after another, after another. And I think some of it is not even so well planned out. Very often, cult leaders just say one thing and then they say another thing and none of it comes together. It doesn't follow, again, something logical. You and your brain try to make something logical out of it because that's how we are wired. That's what makes us feel right in situations. But cult leaders are really not bound by the sense that they have to make sense because they have let you know that if it doesn't make sense to you, again, you're just not kind of trying hard enough to understand it. One of the things that happens, though, is that people will suddenly have this moment where a light bulb goes off a bit, where they start to notice that somebody isn't who they say they are and somebody isn't who everyone thinks they are. And in that moment, it can be very chilling. And at first, again, you can doubt yourself. But then when you start to really see it, you don't know what to do with it. There's nobody to talk to. It's not safe to take someone aside and say, mm, am I being sexually abused by this leader? That's not part of the environment. That's not part of the dialogue. That's not part of the culture. So you suffer in silence. And you also might feel like you're not even supposed to accept it as suffering. So you just experience it in silence, sometimes then not being able to put words to it because you don't know what's happening to you and if it really is abuse or not. So a lot of people 
will start to recognize that someone is a lot more than they said they were, meaning they are abusive, they are controlling, they are shaming, they are people who are doing this for ego aggrandizement. They're really so self centered and they are more either narcissistic or cruel than you ever knew or than anyone you'd ever met. But this other piece of it that I think isn't talked about as much, but that Sat Pavan did mention, is that there's something equally alarming and jarring to the system when the person who you're supposed to be looking up to is not only this person who is more something than you realize, like more of an egomaniac, but when you realize that they are so much less than you thought they were, that they don't have the same level of conscience that you do, that they might not even have the same level of spirituality or intelligence. They're just very good at seeming very good. And they're highly manipulative. And so for some people, the jarring part is realizing that someone is more awful than they realized. And for others who really were looking up to someone as being their source of nirvana or answers or protection, it is that much more difficult and also equally jarring to find out how they are so much less and sometimes so much less than you. I wish Sapavan well and I wish her family well. They're lucky to have her. She's a special person. And I'm glad you got to hear the second part of my conversation with her. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.